Welcome, okay. everybody, and welcome, Ellie. Great. Can you all see the screen that says financial modeling for startup companies? We can. Okay, good. Um, just by way of, uh, uh, of um, transparency, I've got two screens. I'm seeing all of you here, and I'm seeing my presentation screen over there. So if I look like I'm looking off to the, to the side, it's not because I'm not uh, paying attention to you. It's because that's where my presentation is. Um, let's see if we can make this work the way it's supposed to work. There we go. So this is really about you know, financial modeling for, um, you know, for the purpose of raising funds. However, financial models have, have other uses uh, for internal use. You know, I have a, a client that I did a financial model for many years ago, uh, more than 20 years ago, that, that ended up being the basis for his annual budget. And uh, so, you know, if it's set up right, it becomes, it's not just a, a presentation tool for selling your company to investors, but it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's a tool that you can use in your business. Um, I'd like to start out by saying, what do investors want? Investors want to understand the value of what they're getting. In other words, they really want to understand what they're investing in. Uh, if, they give, if they write you a check and, and they want to maximize the return and minimize their risk. And, and your job in, in everything you communicate to a potential investor is to you know, a appeal to their greed and to minimize their fear. And so I'm gonna ask you a question. What is it that investors fear the most? Jeff, what's that? Missing out on the new next big thing. No, I don't think so. That's a, that's a good, it's a good answer, it's a good answer, but that's not the thing that they fear the most. Sari, your hand is raised. Losing money? No, they all know that if they're going to make an investment, there's a good chance they're going to lose money. Win some, lose some. We'll take one more, and then I'll tell you. I see Lamont. Is that your hand that's up? Yes, it is. I would think it's failure. Yeah, well, if they fail, you learn lessons from failure. But what investors fear the most, if you're pitching to them, their biggest fear is you. People invest in people and people want to know that they can trust and have confidence in the people they invest in. And, and, uh, you know, and, and Len, just jump in any time. But I've heard over and over and over and over again, you know, for, you know, and I've been in this, I've been in this world since the early eighties that, you know, VCs will tell you the old, the old saying is they bet on the jockey, not on the horse. That, that the biggest concern is that they're going to write you a check and, and, and you're going to blow their money because you don't know how to run a business. You, you conduct business with people who you know, who you like, who you trust. And, and at the end of the day, like I said, people invest in people. And so that is really what this is all about. It's about creating a financial model that builds confidence. And, you know, it, it, I apologize in advance if I, if I repeat myself at times throughout this presentation. Um, that's, that's going to happen, but here we go. And in some ways that may reinforce it. So you and your financial model have to demonstrate the following, that you can be trusted, that you understand business in general, that you know your specific business model and what drives that business model, that you know how to make money, that you know how to execute. And, and that's really what the model is about. Um, and the goals of your investor pitch, again, to build confidence, demonstrate credibility, create trust, and to show that you could make money. So why do you need a financial model? The financial model, well, let's see, let's take a, a, a quote from Richard Morgenstern, a former president, of, past president of Tech Coast Angels. Business plans are seldom required or seen, but I do expect to see a financial model. The reason is that while the actual rarely meets the forecast, the assumptions that underline the forecast model tells me a lot as to whether the team understands the market and its business. In other words, 
this financial model that you're going to present to your investors is about you and your understanding of what drives the business. It has to tell a story. So let's be honest, no matter what, any financial forecast be wrong, unless I don't know, do any of you, if you raise your hand, if you happen to own a, an actual working crystal ball, but <laughs> my, the peanut gallery over here, also known as, as Sandy Eisenberg, my wife of 47 years, has just informed me that she has a magic wand. Which, <laughs> it's a Harry Potter wand that, uh, that she got at Universal. That is not going to help you with a, create a financial model. And investors are going to come up with their own numbers no matter what. Financial forecasting is really an oxymoron. You'll hear me say over and over again that I, I refer to this as a financial model, not as a financial forecast. You know, if, if you're a, a Fortune 500 company that's been in business for 50 years, you can pretty much forecast what next year's revenues and profits are going to be. But if you're a startup and you have no history and you don't know, you don't know who your customers are going to be, you can't really forecast. All you can do is, is, is put together a model that, that tells the story of, of your business. You can, however, forecast what you plan to do. That is the only thing that you really have control over. You don't have control over your customers. You don't have control over the market. You do have control over what you plan to do. So that's gonna become the basis of this financial story that you tell investors. The purpose of your financial model, and I, again, I know this is repetitive, but it's worth repeating, to demonstrate your understanding of business, to test your assumptions, to show how you plan to execute, to estimate how much cash you need based on your execution plans, to determine how much you can afford to spend, and to share your financial vision which is, is really important um, because investors want to know what you're thinking. They want to know, are you thinking and, and do you have a basis for growing a large company or are, are you really looking at something that, that is more of a, um, shall we call, call it a family business or, or a lifestyle business? It's, it's interesting. One of the things that I do on an annual basis is participate in the USC pitch fest um, and I've done it a number of times with others and you know, people will put together a business plan that they're really excited about they think they have a great product and it'll show that that they're going to get to you know, seven or eight million dollars in five years and they're really excited about that and they should be but an investor is not going to be excited about that it's certainly not a VC investor or, or, or a traditional, you know, um, angel group investor. You know, the, what, what, if there's going to be a high risk venture type of investment to be made, then there has to be the potential for a huge payout at the end of the day. And if, if that exit is showing that it's going to be a three or four or five million dollar business, then your financial vision is not that exciting. Why should I invest in you if, 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 if you don't think you can grow this into something that's, that's really big and exciting? Um, again, if you, have, you know, if you want to jump in with a question or comment, uh, please do so. And uh, you know, I, if you disagree with anything I say, feel free to, do, to, to jump in there as well. And also to support, but not make your case for value, valuation. Um, the, the, the case for valuation is really going to be, it's going to be a negotiation. You're going to feel your company is worth, you know, is there anybody here who hasn't seen Shark Tank? You know, that investors, or rather I should say entrepreneurs come into Shark Tank with a valuation proposal. And a lot of times the sharks push back and say, you know what? I like your idea, I like your business, I like you, you know, 10% for a half a million dollars and a $5 million valuation today is just too rich. But I'll tell you what, I'll give you your half a million dollars for 25%. And, 
And, and so what they've done is they've knocked down the valuation from, you know, from 5 million to one and a quarter million. Um, I'm sorry, to 2 million. And so that, that's, that's kind of the way it goes. I've, I've heard many of venture capitalists say, you know, let us tell you what it's worth and you can either accept it or, or reject it. Um, the, the, the valuation based on a financial model that, that has, uh, you know, no clear, you know, picture of the future of the company is, is, is not something that you should ever, you know, draw a line in the sand and, and stick to. You should always be willing to listen to and be open-minded to, to, um, to counter proposals. And just because your numbers, just because your financial financial model supports evaluation, that doesn't mean that others are going to see it that way. So, so you know, keep an open mind. You don't have to accept any offer, um, but you, you do, you know, if you need money to grow your business or to even launch your business, then, then you should be flexible. And, uh, you know, it may mean giving up more than, than you plan to, but, uh, you know, it's, it's better to have a smaller percentage of something that is actually on the way towards success than 100% of nothing. So let's go on to the next slide to repeat the goal of your model, again, to build confidence, to demonstrate credibility, to create trust and to show how you make money. Your model has to tell a story. Quick question, Ali. Yes. So, I mean, if, if your financial model and, you know, presumably the founder knows more about their business and the industry than the VC does, if, if, if that's not compelling for the valuation, then why would the VC's info or their perspective be more compelling? Well, first of all, the founder doesn't always know more about their market than, than the VC. Um, okay, yeah. That's number one. Number two is um, the founder may know more about what it takes to actually grow a business. I'm sorry, the VCs may know more about, you know, based on their own experience, their own business experience, about what it takes to grow a business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just because a market is out there doesn't mean that, that it's going to fall in your lap. So, um, you know, and, and, there, and, and there may be, times when the founder does know more about the business than, than the VCs or the angel investor. But, you know, it, if they're not going to accept your story and they're not going to invest in it, then you have to be, you know, willing to be open-minded to, to an you know, alternate view. I mean, your goal is to get, get your business off the ground to get funded. Okay. Right. Yeah. And there will be times, I mean, look, Brandy, it can be very frustrating for, uh, for an entrepreneur to, you know, to go through all of the motions and jump through the hoops and at the end of the day have a VC who really doesn't understand your business say, I'm sorry, I just, you know, it doesn't feel right for me. And I would say, you know, and, and, and Len, you can chime in on this, that you're better off with a VC who does understand your business, who can provide more than just a, a, a checkbook, but, but for some expertise that can, can help you succeed. Yeah, I would wholly agree with that. All right, thank you. Glenn, if, you're, if you said something, you're muted, so. Yeah, no, I will, I will chime in, absolutely. Remember the price of the money for, for venture capital is quite high. So you need much more than just the check uh, to get the value out of that money. So industry and domain expertise and connections within that industry, I think are very important uh, when you're selecting the types of uh, capital you're taking on your cap table. So the model has to tell a story. It's not just about the business, it's about you and your thinking behind the model. It's not just about the, it's not just about the formulas, it's about your actions that, that to drive those formulas. It's not just about the results. It's about how you affect those results with your plans. And again, it is about the story. Before you can determine revenues and costs, you really must forecast the activities and the timing considerations to drive revenues. Identify the partnerships required to provide value. Know your necessary resources. 
and derive reasonable cause and effect assumptions to derive revenues. Know who's going to buy your product and service, how much you know, they are likely to buy, how much they're going to pay for it, and how are you going to use your MVP or your you know, prototypes your, your, uh, you know, to, to, to learn, to go into the market and test the market. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead and then jump back because I think this is really important. It's a good time to, to talk about it. If, if, if we're talking about forecasting revenues, I, I like to build models that use a cascading approach. And I really think it's the best way to show, to demonstrate that you understand your market. You start with your sales marketing plan, your plan of execution, the things that you do have control over. What are the costs, the resources, the timing? And that plan of execution, based on some assumption, will generate leads or eyeballs, you know, that, you know, it's, in other words, get attention to your product or, or service, which leads to paying customers, you know, what is the conversion rate that, that uh, you know, the, the, you know if, if you have 100 leads, how many customers is that going to generate? Is it, is it 10? Is it 100? Is it 50? Uh, which results in a number of transactions or sales in units at that price. If, uh, you know, if you have a, a product or service that has some recurring revenues, you can build that into it. If it's a, you know, a one-time purchase kind of a thing, then you're going to need more customers than, than uh, you know, I, I just bought an HP all-in-one printer. It's the first printer I've bought in seven years. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not a repeat sale. And then that number of transactions or sales in units at a price that translates into revenues. The mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs make is they start at the bottom. They just start forecasting revenues. And, and you may actually have a good sense of what, you know, what those revenues are going to be. However, that doesn't tell the story. This cascading approach tells the story. You say to your investors, look, this is our plan. It's going to generate this many leads, which is going to generate this many customers, which is going to generate this many units of sales which is going to result in sales in, in dollars. So keep that in mind. If, 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 if I were to give you one, one slide to take from this whole presentation, this would be it. And so let's go back. Um, know your business model, how you will make money, how you plan to grow your company. And it's, and, and, a lot of what's here is going to go into the financial model as well. You know, what are your customer segments? Um, what is your, you know, what are your value prop? What is your value proposition or propositions? Um, this is really kind of getting a little bit beyond the financial model. Uh, when you're talking to your customers, that's important to, I mean, your customers, your investors to talk about these things, the marketing verticals and channels. A lot of times uh, these, these financial models should be segmented by, by channels. Uh, what are the customer relations? What are the different the different revenue streams? Uh, the, 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 the thing that I want to drive home here is that, and, and you'll see this on, on future slides, is that your financial model should be granular. It should really reflect you know, the, the various segments of your business uh, it, because that tells a story. It shows that you understand where your revenues are going to come from. And also take into account your key resources, activities, partnerships, and your cost structure. And that's also going to be part of the financial model. Rules for financial modeling. First, they have to be credible. I'll never be accurate. Because, like I said, you don't have a crystal ball. But they have to be credible. You know, they have to take into account external constraints, meaning the, you know, the size of the market, the availability of resources, the... Uh, um, you know, the, all of the things that, 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 that you don't have control over. It has to be critical, credible taking into account internal constraints. You know, you may think that you've got a $5 billion market and you can just 
wave my wife's magic Harry Potter wand and uh, and, and and grab ten percent of that market to to build a a, a fifty million dollar company or five hundred million dollar company. Fact of the matter is, companies are constrained by their ability to hire and put into place infrastru- infrastructure. In some cases, that's uh, you know, it's it's, you know it's, it's it's facilities, it's it's uh, it's systems. I mean, you, you just you know, the, the magic wand isn't there. The build businesses need to be built using the building blocks, and it takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes people, and it takes money. And that's also an internal constraint, and also based on investor expectations and and their natural skepticism. Hey, Ellie, I have a question. Yes. On sorry. a scale of one to ten, one being very conservative, ten being very optimistic, where do you suggest that your clients make their estimates and projections from? Five. So the perfect number. Yeah. No, I I I want my clients to put the number to, or to, to build a model based on where they honestly believe it's going to be. Don't bring it down to the point where, you know, that, that, that uh, um, it's, it's, it's below your expectations. Don't fluff it up. I really believe that, that, you know, you give it, you, you try to hit the bullseye. Um, at least in terms of where you're aiming at. And, and you heard me give an answer to that very quickly. So, you know, this is obviously something we've had many discussions with, with clients in the past. Um, there, there is, as I said already, there is no one right answer. And no matter how conservative you think it is, never use the word conservative because investors hate that. <laughs> so, so if you're pitching to investors, eliminate the word conservative from your vocabulary, because it just you know it just it's hmm. it's an eye roller. Um, and when I say investor expectations and skepticism, you never want to put a number in front of an investor that's going to make you look like you like like you have no clue what you're talking about. I mean, you know, I I remember I remember. Years, God, years ago, um, some some guy had some uh, presentation at the, at, the, at the Central Coast uh, Venture Forum where he had forecasted 500 million, from startup to five years, $500 million in revenues. And, um, and, and, and I said, don't do that. He said, well, here, you know, here's the, Here's the market. Here's the potential. We can easily get there. I said, you may get there, and I, 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 I give you my blessing that you do. No investor is going to believe you. You're just going to look foolish. Scale it down. And oh, guys, see a couple of a uh, couple of my friends just joined us. Asher, how are you? Barbara, it's good to see you. Um, and so. Uh, so, so keep in mind, you know, put yourself in, in the seat of the investor and ask yourself, is, is an investor going to believe that, 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 that your forecast, that your model is, is achievable? And if the answer is, you know, even if you do, and if the answer is no, scale back. Because you know, they, they, they just don't want to talk to people who are, who they perceive as being completely unrealistic. Your model has to be supportable based on detail and based on outside benchmarks. So, for example, if, uh, <laughs> at least in the pre-COVID world, if you were going to rent, you know, need, need to rent uh, a, a 10,000 square foot warehouse, and you're operating in an area where the rental is two dollars and fifty cents a square foot. Don't assume that it's going to be ten thousand dollars a month, and don't put that in your model because that all that shows is that you haven't done your homework. So and, you know, same thing with salaries, the same thing with you know other expenses. 
you know, make sure that that uh, that that you test your assumptions by going outside to uh, you know to to get valid information. Okay, and the other one, tell the business story. I've already said that. We've talked about that. Putting together the model, you know, follow convention. I'm a big believer of don't use a template. And it's interesting. I, these days, I'm getting a lot of emails from from a company that has put together a bunch of financial templates and they, they may be very good. And I've heard the argument going the other way. If, if, if your goal, if your aim is to convince your investors that you understand your business, then the model should be tailored to your business. It has to tell your story. It shouldn't tell somebody else's story. Don't try to, you know, put a square peg in a round hole and, and you know, yeah, it's a shortcut, it's it's not it's not the best way to go. It's not the best way to tell your story. Use a bottom up detailed approach, and that falls in line with the cascading that I was talking earlier, talking about earlier. But it also applies to expenses. It applies to your marketing budget. It applies to your headcount, the staffing plan. Show your investors that 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 you put thought and detail into this. I am not a big fan of using a lot of worksheets. I was recently given a business plan model that I'm redoing for a new client that had 27 tabs in the worksheet. It had one tab for 2022 expenses, one for 223, one for 2024, one for 2025. They had five tabs for income statements. Here's what happens. And, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you this when, when we get to the end of this, I'll, I'll bring up a model and give you an idea. When you put a financial model projection in a uh, pitch deck or in a business plan, you're going to give a highly summarized, you know, one slide snapshot of your business. Before an investor writes that check, he, she, they are going to want to get dive into the model. And you don't want to present a model to an investor that is going to be difficult to navigate, that is going to have hidden tabs off to the, uh, off to the right, that has so many links that, that it's, it's, hard, it's hard to follow what, what's going on in the model. I, I'm just a big, big believer in it. My models basically have four tabs in the workbook. I have one that has all of the all of the revenues and cost of revenues for all five years on one sheet. It's a lot easier to navigate going up and down and across one sheet than it is to have to keep going back and forth and back and forth. And I have another one that shows the staffing plan, and I have a third one that shows all the other expenses. And then a fourth one that just rolls it all up into a financial statement. That's it. And then there's a fifth one that combines it, you know, that summarizes it into five years. So you can easily copy and paste it into a, uh, into a business plan. There are two very fundamental problems with having a lot of tabs in the model. One is, as I said to you, it, it becomes a navigation nightmare. And two, Every link between two spreadsheets is an opportunity to make an error. And so you want to try to minimize that. It's, it's very embarrassing to give a financial model to an investor and have them discover an error. So try to keep things simple. Um, I avoid named ranges. Try to keep it simple. I avoid pivot tables because not everybody understands how to use a pivot table. So, so, you know, it's basically um, a very simple, easy to understand model. And that, that's what investors seem to appreciate. The drivers, i.e. the assumptions, should be right there next to the numbers that they drive. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of financial models, and, and again, there are people who will disagree with what I'm telling you. A lot of financial models, will they'll put all the assumptions on one tab. That's not the way I do it. The way I do it is you'll see, on the, on the left side of each page, three or four columns where all the assumptions are. And then the rest of it is the, you know, the month to month to month um, 
results of those assumptions. So you can make a change and see the change right right then and there. Um, it's it's again, it's it, it it makes it easier to understand. It makes it the investors appreciate it, and I strongly um, advise that. Be granular. You know, take it down to you know low levels of detail. Um, this is this is this is the next one. Change and shade data inputs, not formulas. This is just a, um, shall we say, a work habit recommendation. You know, when you're working with a financial model, there's a lot of stuff that goes on subconsciously. If you always put your formulas in unshaded cells, then your brain tells you never to write over those cells once the formulas are in place. Put all of the changes in, you know, in shaded cells, so you know that you can make changes in areas that don't screw up the formulas. And uh, so, I recommend that. Uh, don't ignore the cash flow implications. You, the, you need to understand that in, in a lot of businesses, in most businesses, there's a difference between profit and cash flow. You need to be able to show both, and you need to have good assumptions for for collections and for payments, and and and, and the time differences between those. Um, typically the horizon should be three to five years or until exit. If, uh, if, if you know that there's going to be an earlier exit, then I recommend that. Um, it's interesting. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the companies that I've worked with over the years are, are pharmaceutical companies that, um, never really plan to go to market. Their, their exit plan, their exit strategy is phase one clinical trials, phase two clinical trials maybe phase three clinical trials and somewhere between phase two and phase three or at the end of phase three, sell the whole thing to a big pharmaceutical company. And so what do you do then if you're, if you're, if you're not planning to have any revenues for 10 to 15 years? Well, then, then your, your model should tell the story of what you believe the, the, the market is, is uh, market potential is, and it should be based on, on the cost of getting through those trials. So uh, again, you know, avoid templates, make sure that it, it, it follows exactly how you plan to run your business. Forecast by month. Another, another uh, rule, if you will, that, that I've challenged and, and, and believe in strongly in challenging is the one that says, you know, just, you know, do the first 12 months by month and then, you know, and, and then the last four years by year. I'm going to tell you that, that if you want to build an effective financial model, if you're going to do a five-year model, it should have 60 columns, one for each month. A three-year model should have 36 columns. And there's a very key fundamental reason for that. First of all, you don't want to, to, to have formulas that, that change over the course of the, of the life of the uh, model. Number two is things happen between January and December that get obscured by an annual model. Cash flow dips, seasonal um, changes in, in revenues. Uh, it's, it, it's a, you, know, you, you might find that by doing a, a model that, 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 that does not go month by month by month by month, that you're hiding a, a, a cash deficit that, that you won't find until until you get there. Um, the other thing is that I that I learned very early on is that when you transit transition from month twelve to year two, very strange and and, and difficult to reconcile. Things take place. It's you know it it's just you know businesses don't grow year over year. They grow day over day. And I'm not saying you should have 365 columns, but you know they 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 grow over time. So my strong recommendation is that when you put together your financial model, that you do it on a monthly basis, no matter what no matter what period of time it is, that each column be a month. You can summarize those months off to the left, uh, so you have annual totals, but do the the model by month, and then review and test. You should have some you know some checks and balances in the model especially to make sure that things are staying in balance are, are there any questions or comments here i've got one uh this is lamont uh, 
you just mentioned that you've worked with pharmaceutical firms and usually it's, it's clinical trial by clinical trial. How then does one in that particular category forecast by a month? If, well, first of all, um, you, should, you should forecast your, you, know, you should model your expenses by month. Okay. Um, if, 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 um, if, if you're, because that'll tell you, you know, clearly when you need to get the next round to get to the next level. Um, if, if you're, if you're in a, you know, pharmaceutical company that is, that is not planning to have revenues before an exit, then there's no point doing a revenue for, you know, for a revenue model for the, for the period of time. So, um, Anyway, I hope that answers your question a lot. Yeah. We already talked about cascading. Segment your markets. Um, you know, take into account individual customers or different types of businesses, different channel partners and your size and demographics. Um, a lot of times what I'll do with my clients is say, okay, let's, let's have one line for for customers that have a hundred employees or less and let's have, and it's actually, I'm working with one client that is, um, it happens to be a, a pre-accelerator company um, that, that's, that's selling a subscription model, a, a platform to different companies and the pricing for very large companies is different than the pricing for medium sized companies, which is different than the pricing for smaller companies. So I said, you know, Let's, let's model those out separately on different lines. Don't just blend it all together. That shows the investors what the plans are and who the target customers are, how much you plan to charge them. And, and uh, it, it just made, you know, like I said, it, it, uh, it sounds like a broken record here, but it, that, that's how you tell the story to your investors. Hey, quick question for you. Yes, Brandy. And I'm so sorry because I know it's hard to talk to the blank screen, but my camera is just not. It's, uh, it's okay. It's, it's not my best tech day. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you. So you, you were talking about putting the numbers, um, the assumptions next to the, the, the numbers that they're driving. Mm -hmm. Do you ever um, forecast or I guess model across economic scenarios? So for instance, if I think next year, um, you know, we'll, we'll still be in COVID and that might change my assumption. But then if we're not, um, you know, if, we, if we're in a different place, th that'll have different numbers. And then maybe I can, you know, weight those and say, you know, there's a 50% chance of this happening at 50% and then, you know, take the average or something. Yeah, no, first of all, first of all, yes. Um, you know, if, if you came to me with, with that scenario, I'd say, okay, let's build a model that way. Let's, let's, um, and, and there are a couple of different ways to do that. We we could we could toggle it. Yeah. And um, I've I've done that a, a lot of times. I don't I'm trying to think if I have one that I can show you, where, um, where, where we have scenario one, scenario two, mm -hmm. and um, and and you use it you know, and you use a drop down box so that uh, when you toggle it, it doesn't it doesn't uh, the, you know the formulas read it properly. Um, and uh, no, you should. Uh, not not only can you, but but you should. And it's not that difficult to do. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. So you're welcome. Uh, the inputs, the activities that drive business. This is the uh, you know, the um, probably the first line of the cascade. You know, your sales team, and what can you expect from your sales team? Advertising and promotions. If you know, if you if you spend ten thousand dollars on an uh, on an ad campaign how many leads is that going to generate um content development if you're you know if you're in a uh, business that that requires content if you're in for example um you know streaming media or applicant or 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 an app business that requires content uh, the the availability of that content and the timing, the availability of that content is 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 the start of a, of a new revenue stream, um, as well. You know, content development, delivery, same thing. Customer support. Um, you know, there could be uh, there could be customer support revenues. 
you know, and the uh, you know, business development, partner development, staff, travel and entertainment, legal shows and events, you know, those, those things, um, like for, you know, I, I say legal, say, well, what does legal have to do with it? Well, if you're in a business that, that uh, requires that you, that you negotiate and close contracts, then the, you know, the, the cost and, and time of getting those contracts done is uh, something that's going to ultimately generate um, revenues, you know, trade shows and events, et cetera. The, these are, this is the execution plan, and, and that's where you start. Inputs, um, pricing model. How will your pricing be defined and quantified for each revenue source? What is the price per unit? You can use a subscription model, uh, price per transaction, fee for service, et cetera. Is it going to be a, re, um, a recurring revenue model? You know, that's you know, you need to understand and show what that what that uh, revenue source, that pricing model is. The next thing you're going to do is once you get past the uh, the, the 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 revenue model, now we have to layer on top of that your costs. What are the direct costs? What is it? What is it? cost to bring that product or service to a customer um you know does what does each sale represent in terms of incremental costs is, is it labor and material to make a product uh or royalties or commissions or um you know you know splits with with, with partners you know it, it, most businesses uh, and, and we call this the contribution margin. Most businesses have some cost associated with each sale. Um, in, in a hardware business, those costs tend to be a much higher percentage than, than in a software business. But there's, there's typically some cost. Then you have your, your period costs, your staffing related costs, including you know, payroll, payroll taxes, employee benefits, uh, Etc. You know what is it? What does it cost you to add a person? What are your product design costs? Are you going to be hiring people internally? You're going to be hiring or you know, out engaging outside engineering firms. What are your monthly overhead? And again, this is where we get granular, right? Your insurance, your legal, rent, utilities, dues and subscriptions. Put it all in the model, and and and, and it'll look like. You've taken it into account. This is what it's going to cost to run your business. In addition to that, you need to ask, estimate and take into account your startup costs and other, and other capital expenditures. Those are like you know, the one-time costs that you need to get your business off the ground. Uh, employee, furniture, and equipment. I'll, I'll tell you something. With everybody uh, considering going remotely, this, these become, uh, for a lot of businesses, there's obviously going to be a lot less than, than they were Two years ago, uh, server equipment. What you know, do you need to have software built? Uh, I'm sure you can think of others. And by the way, you need to have a balance sheet. It's not enough just to do a, a, a projected business uh, income statement or PL and a projected cash flow statement. And people are saying, well, what do I need a balance sheet for? Who cares? As long as I can show the profit and the cash. And the answer is because the balance sheet is, I don't mean this to be a pun, but it's, it's, it's your ultimate check and balance for the, between the income statement and the cash flow. It shows the differences. And I can guarantee you that if there are errors in your model, in your income statement or your cash flow model, they will show up in the balance sheet. I'll just give an example. Um, if you put together a balance sheet that's, that is being, and, and the balance sheet is just driven off of the income statement and the cash flow statement anyway. If your accounts receivable or your inventory or your accounts payable are going through the roof or if they're going negative, then that says that there's an error in either your cash flow statement or in your income statement. And you might not otherwise catch those errors if it weren't for the fact that you have a properly built balance sheet in your model. It's okay, you can ignore the phone. I'm not going to. So Donovan, do you have a question or a comment? Let me put this on mute. 
Um, this is Josefina. Sorry, I know. Oh, I'm sorry. The no worries. Uh, I was wondering, will we be able to get the slides from this presentation? This is so informative. Um, yes, they, they, they will only cost you about ten thousand dollars, but I'll be no happy worries. to. <laughs> no, yeah, case, no. May I ask you? <laughs> first of all, case... first of all, yes, I'm very happy to send you the slides. Or You're Len, so sweet. Or, or Len can have Donovan send you the slides. And, right. and this recording, this this presentation is recorded, so you can watch it as, as many times as you like. Wonderful. You know, it's interesting, I Len, I don't know if you realize the, the, the reach that you have, but um, just a little side story. Two years ago, I was, uh, no, it wasn't two years ago, it was last year because it was after COVID. I was at the USC um, pitch fast. I can't, for the life of me, I can never, I think it's called SEED, S-E-E-D. And and I was in one of the rooms, you know, they put two or three judges in a room and then you have, you know, you, you, you see like a dozen presentations in, two, in three hours with just a little break in between. And the, the third company to come into my room, you know, had a CFO who was based in Washington, D.C. And they come into the room and, you know, the, and they, each room is a breakout session. And, and this guy looks and he goes, oh, my God, you're Ellie Eisenberg. I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, I saw your pre-accelerator presentation and I built my model based on your pre-accelerator presentation. So, <laughs> so I was like, like, you know, like for a moment, you know, I felt like a celebrity, but really the celebrity there is the pre-accelerator and, and people, you know, people are watching these things. I know you post them, Len. I mean, this this one made it to to some startup entrepreneur based on the other side of the country. So um, that's neither here nor there. It just popped in my head. So <laughs> when you, when you do a presentation, when you decide after you put your financial model together, you decide that you're going to put it into a pitch deck. Don't use tables especially if you're going to be standing in front of a group of people pitching your company. And the reason why is if you use a table like this, you will lose your audience. They will be looking at it, trying to study the numbers. Some people will be adding up the numbers. They'll be, you will lose your audience. It's, it's just too much detail. Later on during due diligence, when, when they want to dive into your numbers, that's fine. They, they can get all the detail that, that they want, but not in a pitch deck. In a pitch deck, use charts. Because this is easy to digest. It tells the story very quickly. It shows the financial vision very quickly. Um, you know, you can just look at it and say, okay, I see that you're going to start out, you know, in, in year one, you're going to get to two and a half million. And in the year Five, you're going to beat around 20 million and you're going to be profitable in cash. And, and, and that's it. So um, that is the, that is the, the um, PowerPoint part of the presentation. Is there anything that you want before I go into, Len, how much time, how much more time? Do we have? About another 15 minutes there, uh, Ellie. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, is on a very high level, show you what a what a financial model looks like and um and 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 just demonstrate illustrate some of the things that i was talking about earlier i've got here two financial models one is a product-based model and and uh, another one is more of a uh a, a, you know, an app-based model. Let's just take a look at this. You'll notice that, like I said, there are only five tabs here. There's a revenue and costs, staffing and CapEx, operating expenses, monthly financials, and annual summary. It's all right there. If, if we'll start with the revenue and costs, you'll see that all of the assumptions are here. You don't have to, you don't have to go back and forth between here and, and, and some assumption uh, tab to, to, to work the model. Um, I'm just gonna show you one really cute Excel trick that you know probably some, maybe some of you have seen before. 
uh, or have, have know about, but a lot of people don't. You see that this says 500 per 10,000. You know what happens if you were to type in 500 per 10,000? You see that, that um, hold on a second. Why didn't that get screwed up? All right, let me go, let me go back. Let's, let's use this as an example. That, 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 that worked, that didn't work the way I wanted it because there are some other things in there. But if you were to type in 10% of users, you get that. And, and, and that's what would happen if I were to type in all, in all three of these boxes. Instead, what's in that field is simply the value 10%, as you can see up here. So one of the things I like to do is, is make models so that they're, they're self-documented. That comes from, you know, my, from my, uh, my CPA days when, when documentation was, was everything. And the way you do that is by using what is called a custom format. And, and I really recommend doing this as often as you can in your models. When you use a custom format, whatever you put in quotations will display, but it is not part of the value of your, of, of, of your, of your uh, field. So you'll see here, it says 75 per 100, but the value is only 75. It says here 500 per 10,000, the value is only 500. What's great about this is because when you sit down, when you sit down with your investor, you don't want to have to be explaining the formulas. You want to be explaining the inputs and the, and the assumptions and the reasons behind the inputs. That's a business discussion. If, 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 if you have to say, okay, so where does this number come from? Or where does this number come from? Or where does this number come from? That's an Excel spreadsheet discussion. That's not a business discussion. So you take it to a higher level when you, when you set up your, 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 a sheet like this. Um, you'll see here I've got the marketing budget. These are the inputs. This is the ex execution plan. Email campaigns, online ads, promotion. Let me make this a little bit bigger. There we go. So th in this case, we had four legs of the marketing program. The way this works is the client and I put in the marketing budget. And each of these numbers, the number of users was driven off of the marketing budget. Now, so what we did is, is we created a demographic matrix, 48% of the users under the age of 18, 28% of the users from 18 to 34, and 24% over the age of 34. And so there were different drivers for each of these metrics. So online ads, let's just keep in, in mind here, we've got 10 per 100, three users per 100, and two users per 100 in, in, in each of those three metrics. Let's go to online ads. And you'll see that there are 3,000 users based on $20,000 of ads. 20,000 in ads is two times 500, which is 1,000. I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong line. It's 10 per 100. So it's, uh, if we spent $20,000, that's two, uh, 200 plus, am I doing this math right? All right, so it's 10, three, three so it's, yeah, it's 15 per 100. And so you can see that $20,000, uh, it's 200 times $15 or $3,000. Are you following the math here? So that comes out to 3,000. What happens if we change that and say, okay, what, you know, what if we spend 10,000 on online ads? That number in the white cell changes automatically. What if we said, well, you know, in this demographic, we're gonna get 25 per 100. Then that goes back up to 3,000. So you see, as you change the inputs, the results change right in front of you. Um, and the, and the white fields are the ones that you don't ever enter into because those are the formulas you'd screw things up. So we've done that. We've created a, a matrix to 
drive the number of users based on the dollars spent on, on different types of marketing uh, events. Then we have a number of new premiums or paid subscriptions. And again, here, there's 90 days after joining, we say 15%, that's the conversion rate that we talked to you about before with the cascading, uh, become new users. And there's also a churn, it says 365 days after joining, 10% of the paid users drop off. So you can see that, that here you've got 300, I'm sorry, 3,380 users, 90 days later, one, two, three, that translates into 575. If you don't believe me, let's take 380. Where'd it go? Oh, let's take 385. I'm sorry. Three, three, eight, three, oh, multiply that times 15%, and there's your 575. So what it did is it, and, and this rather complex formula takes into account the, uh, the, the 90 day lag. There's your total number of users, 575. These are new users. So 575 plus 547 is 1122 and it keeps adding up. And then what you'll see is that a year later, we start to pull out some of the users as they, draw, as, as they drop off. And those are the paid users. We still haven't gotten to the revenues. We also have a line here for, for corporate subscriptions. Remember I said you model different segments uh, separately. Um, this business also had some e-commerce sales. That's also modeled separately. And then the revenue forecast pulls all that together based on your pricing and the units. So if you look at this, this formula here, takes the price per subscription times the number of paid new paid or uh, those are monthly subs. So total paid uh, subscribers and it, it, it translates into revenue. Uh, Ellie, you have a question. I think Brandy. Has I a have question. a question from Brandy Coates. So sorry. Didn't have a last name last time she asked a question. Um, yeah, you can't see my face. You should. At least the whole thing. <laughs> so I'm trying to follow because earlier you you said the main thing that we should take away from this is the cascade. Um, and so if you go up to where you were before, I'm trying to kind of see where the cascade comes. Oh yeah. So let, let me just quickly summarize. So okay. it starts with the inputs. That's the marketing budget. Okay. The, the 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 marketing budget translates into a number of users, number of people who sign up. Okay. That's not revenues yet. That's just people who sign up. This is a freemium model. So people sign up, they don't pay anything yet. Then the next level in the cascade is the number of the number of users that become paid subscribers. Those are your customers. And that 15%, you're getting that from one of the numbers up top then, right? 15% of... 15% of, of this number, of number gotcha. of users... Gotcha. 90 okay. days after joining. Now, keep in mind, right. what, if we, yeah. what if we said 60 days after joining? Did you see what just happened? I don't what think we say, what if we say What if we say zero days after joining? Ah. ah. Okay. What if we okay. say 120, 120 days after joining? Maybe it only goes up to 90. Yeah, I think All it right. only so, goes to So in this, in this model, I, I would have to, I would have to, build this formula out a little bit more to be able to go out to 120. But you, you can see that at zero days, it starts in month one. At 30 days, it starts in month two. At 90 days, it starts in month four. Oh, so, the rules. Okay. Right? Um, if the conversion rate were 50%, those numbers uh -huh. would change. Right? Uh -huh. so, there's, so, so there's step one, step two, step three. We're still not at revenues. We're just now at, at customers. Then the next phase in the cascade is the revenues. And that's taking those number of paid users and multiplying it by some price per user. Makes sense. Okay. okay. And then we have cost of revenue. Notice that this is all one tab. It's, and it goes out 60 months. And at the end of the 60 months, I've got, you know, let's... 
five years summarized gotcha. and those five years can will will now show up in the annual summary uh the magic of excel yeah the magic of excel for sure nice and then, and then that can be um and then that can be copied and pasted into a uh um in, into a spreadsheet now Dash. just by way of uh, uh here we go hey ellie i have a yes. question for you 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 mentioned earlier don't put tables uh, financial tables into your pitch deck what's the best way to give a snapshot in a pitch deck of your financial modeling i i think the best way is to create a chart and if we go to the financial summary, you'll see that there is a there is a chart that's used that's reading the numbers that are there. So, okay. And you take this chart and you can copy it, you know, copy it and, and paste it into a pitch deck. Okay, appreciate so, that. Um, th there's there's a whole lot more that I could show you. Um, you know, in the in the interest of I mean, I'll just you know, in the interest of time, you know, I'm not going to be able to show you a lot of it. But I, you know, the, I, th I think you get the, the, the general gist of it. Um, when I go to staffing, I like to actually put together a, a real staffing plan. Who you're going to hire? When is their start date? When is their end date? If it's if it's somebody you're not planning to keep forever. In this case, you know, founders have asked me, well, you know, you know, I plan to pay myself. 50,000 in year one, 75,000 in year two, and 120,000 in year three. How do you do that? Well, we just model each of those gears separately, and you can see what happens um, when you get to month. Uh, well, in this case, in this case, I took it out. So if I were to, this is 120, this is 12, 31, 20. Make this one, one. You can also see that under the CFO modeling. Oh yeah, you can see that, okay. Right. Um, bum, 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 year one, you didn't, you didn't hire in year well, one. Keep, keep in mind that this is, you know, this is a, what, what's, what's happening here is I have not updated these dates for, you know, for this presentation, but. Yeah, this is a model that gets that gets used over and over and over and over again. So let's 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 do this again. Um, here we go. So you can see in in, in this case that it's it starts January twenty twenty one with the, at the new level. Uh, and again, you're working with inputs. So if, if the salary is to be 60,000, the salary is supposed to be 90,000. You see the numbers change as you change the inputs. Um, if, you know, the, the, and, and by the way, what, what some of these numbers may not work here right now. This is just for illustrative purposes. It's it's a teaching tool that's been that I've, I've made so many changes to so many times that it's that I probably corrupted it. But you know, if, if we were if we were to go through and clean it up, you'd see how how it all works. But I think I think the the point is to demonstrate to illustrate to you the way that this should work is that is that there's a level of detail and you should be able to understand without having to do the math, how much you're planning to pay somebody on an annual basis and when you're planning to start and how long they're going to work for the company. Um, I also have in here other costs associated with, uh, with employment, uh, payroll taxes, workers comp, recruiting and relocation, uh, medical benefits, other employee benefits, and it's all driven off a of salary and headcount. Um, and then from here, I also have, have a forecast for the capital expenditures. And I also have a, not in this model, but in, in oh yeah, I do, uh, a, a, uh, 
a model for for space rental and and it based our assumptions of square foot per employee uh, cost per square foot and you you, know, you set it up so that this becomes a tool and you can just play with it and then the last tab is just uh, expenses broken up in major functional areas g a sales and marketing um, the salaries, payroll taxes, all of these, you'll notice that these expenses are employee-related expenses. They come off of the staffing tab. Anyway, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a challenge to get through this part of the presentation in 15 minutes, but yeah, are there any other questions about this that, that, I can, that I can point to, that I can address? I think maybe kind of a higher level question for me to to people to founders who are working and and you know you just looking at this it seems like besides the the external message to to potential investors this is incredibly valuable to someone to understand their own business developing this model and not not putting even the numbers but putting in the the the, the categories and the yeah. relationships but I could see and you know especially if people aren't using you suggest people not use a, you know a template. You know, how do how do people who might not have a deep background in Excel kind of get past to the ability? What what do, what tools do you suggest or resources or professionals do you suggest to help people get to a point where they're not starting from scratch and mm -hmm. they're not spending so much time working on, you know, even absent pivot tables, it can still be pretty complex to get some of the, the um, yeah, formula it's, right. It's, what do you suggest for it's those? A, it's a good question. Um, look, I... If you can find a template that really mirrors your business or that you can that you can modify to mirror mirror your business, I, I personally have not yet come across a tool that that I've liked other than Excel. Uh, there are tools out there. There are companies that 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 promote them. You know, there are a lot of people, a lot of people like me who know how to put these models together. Mm -hmm. And um you know, somebody who has a lot of experience with it can can probably do it pretty quickly without without breaking the bank. Yeah, um, it's just it's a balance. You want the person to also be deeply involved in it to get the insights from it, but maybe not necessarily have to become an Excel expert, but mm -hmm. focus on being a on their business expert. Yeah. Now, what, what I what I found, Olar, did I, or Oral, Oral, Oral. It's all Oral. good. I'm gonna I'm gonna get. It. I like to pronounce your name correctly. Okay. What, what I find is that if, if you don't make, if you don't make it too, it doesn't have to be complex to be sophisticated. I provide my clients with a tool that they can use and I train them how to use it. And I, I have found a lot of my clients have done pretty good. You know, they can, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll thank me and they'll, they'll run with it and they can use it to help run their business. They can use it to, you know, for future rounds, you know, if, if they screw it up, they'll come back and say, I think I screwed up the formula. You can take a look at it. And usually it doesn't take me much more than maybe 10 or 15 minutes to find the error and fix it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want my clients to be dependent upon me. Is there a value in iterative models? So kind of the first, you know, the model 1.0 is pretty simple, but still gives some insights. And then as the client gets more comfortable, model 2.0 incorporates more inputs, more complexity, kind of matching their understanding of the complexity of the business. And you get to a point where, wow, this is complex enough where this is now something that can go to investors and has, uh, you know, I have the attendant charts and graphs, something like that. There's some rework involved, but maybe it's, you know, instead well, of kind of there's, starting there's with some something. rework, but there's also another way to slice that where you could, um, you could have a toggle switch. You basically, let, let's call it, let's, let's say you put in one or zero where you have sections in the model and you can turn on or off those sections. And okay. if, if it's off, it doesn't roll up to the top. If it's on, it does. Uh, I've done that with a couple of clients and um, it worked out pretty, pretty interestingly. Uh, I also had one client who basically we, we created our own template for a facility that could be replicated as he added additional facilities. And, and, and we were able to put in start dates and have that you know, roll in. It was, uh, it, 
pretty complex, but it was, you know, again, um, once we, once we had it in place, it was pretty easy to work with. Hey, Ellie, we're Thank about you. done with time here. Um, are there any wrap up uh, comments you'd like to make? Uh, I, I think the only wrap-up comment I would like to make is that, you know, if, if you have questions after this, you know, feel free to email me. Um, if, you know, if, you know, I'm, I was before, um, <laughs> before the Jewish holiday of September, uh, was spending two days a week down at the Precelerator, and we start doing that again. So if you're in Santa Monica and you want to get together and, and uh, go over this or anything else, I'm yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I love, I love in you know, in-person face-to-face meetings. Uh, there's a, <clears throat> a coffee bean just down the corridor and uh, the, the Precelerator itself is really a nice facility. Um, I, I, I want to encourage everybody to get to know Barbara Bickham. She's probably the smartest person I've ever met. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I just want to thank everybody for, for being here and, and uh, allowing me to, uh, to, to share this. And, uh, and, and Asher, you and I need to get together. So um, that's about that's about all. You know, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get to see all of you, all of your faces. And uh, I, you know, if you want to have a follow up conversation with me or get to know me or give me an opportunity to get to know you, I'm 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 wide open for that. So. Well, thank you, Ellie. Uh, we always appreciate your wisdom and your knowledge and your ability to share it in a way that's understandable. Uh, and then also uh, for those of you who um, have not applied to the pre-celerator or are interested in it, please, our applications are open. And for those of you who have applied and are waiting, uh, stay tuned. Um, we should have some answers for you soon. And we review these uh, applications on a weekly basis. And for those who... Um, have come and are still coming back for more workshops. Uh, we love having you. It's always good to see new people and uh, people have been coming time and time again. Our next workshop will be in two weeks and we're gonna be talking about um, what is the right exit for your company. Uh, so come in, uh, it's a little bit further down the line but it's uh, a great topic and I'll look forward to seeing you then. So with that, thank you all.